moment. And we begin our Good Friday order of service for tonight. As we now enter into the contemplation of our Lord Jesus Christ and meditate on the salvation of the world through his sufferings, death, burial, and resurrection, let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is a song of Psalm 22. You're welcome to sing along.
Tonight we encounter six people who had front row seats in this incredible real life drama. Mary, friend of Jesus, Simon Peter, Judas, a Roman soldier, Mary, mother of Jesus, and Salome. Sometimes this story feels only like a story to those of us who have heard it so many times, but it was real. It was painful and rich and life-changing for generations and generations of Christians after it. But how much more so for those who lived then and loved this man named Jesus? Just as we have found that there are gifts in the wilderness, these people perhaps also found their place in the world, their true calling, as a result of a walk in the wilderness of life. Let us allow these ancient people to call us more deeply into our faith story. We sing Ubi Caritas. <laughs> before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas objected. Why was the money not used to feed the poor? Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. I was in the middle of the marketplace that day and it hit me like an overwhelming wave of feeling. I loved him so much. It was a love beyond anything I'd ever known. Not romantic, not like a sibling, certainly like family, but he was so much more to me. He was teacher, he was priest, he was wise one, he was hope itself. And for the first time in those days before the terrible thing happened, I felt he might not be invincible. He had told us, he had warned us. He had been saying this could happen all along, but I just couldn't imagine it. He was so eternal, it seemed, like nothing, not even God, would dare to take him away from any of us. But the tension was building. I will beg him, I thought, to not go to Jerusalem. Just go back to Galilee. Go to the hills. Go to Nazareth. Go anywhere but Jerusalem right now. But even as I thought it to myself, I knew that he wouldn't go. This is where he was supposed to be. With all these people gathered for Passover, Jerusalem is where he had to be, and I knew he might never leave. I suddenly became aware that I was standing stuck still, oblivious to all around me here in this marketplace, and I began to double over with fear. But just as I did, my eyes came to rest on the stall to my right a jar, a most beautiful jar of anointing oil. The seller offered it to me for a price that seemed outrageous and I didn't care. No price could compare with the price my teacher, my master would pay. And so I bought it. Whether in life or in death, my beloved friend would need it. 
Mary's anointing of Jesus belonged to the tradition of honoring someone with sweet smelling oil made of a combination of many herbs. This was used at the consecration of kings and also as anointing for burial. In this one act, Mary offers signs of love and honor. The early Christians then used the same scented oil as part of their baptismal and confirmation rites to emphasize their new identity with Christ, which also means anointed one. So tonight, inspired by Mary's act, we will receive this anointing as those early Christians did, with a sign of the cross and the words, you are God's beloved child. I have with me some oil that Elva's husband, John uh, Ellsworth Winter, a pastor from Gettysburg and where I served before coming to Alexandria, gave left for me. And this is a scented oil. Now, some of you probably have some oil at, if you have it on your table. And I'll invite you just to take some oil. I'm going to pour it into this cup. And first, let me bless you with this oil. I'll make the sign of the cross. You are God's beloved child. And now you can also anoint someone else that is with you or yourself with the sign of the cross. I am God's beloved child. And we continue. Oh, sacred head now wounded with grief and shame way down. Now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. O sacred head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine. Yet thou despised and glory, I joy to call thee mine. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does thy face now languish, which once was bright as morn. Thy grief and bitter passion were all for sinners gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be. Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to thee. Lord, be my consolation, shield me when I must die. Remind me of thy passion when my last hour draws nigh. These eyes new faith receiving from thee shall never move. For all who die believing die safely in thy love.
When they finished supper, Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? After he had washed their feet and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? Learn, do you know what I have done to you? Learn from me. You call me teacher, Lord. If I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He continually baffled me my whole time with him, one surprise after another. Jesus turned my world upside down, especially when it came to relationships. We would worry about who was his right-hand man, and he would always turn it around with his last shall be first stories. I wanted to know where I stood with him. I needed for him to be my Lord, my master, my teacher, and he was. But then he went and did this that night. Now, none of us were of really high lineage, but we weren't slaves or servants. I mean, at the meal that night, there were people to wait on us. This is service that just comes with any good room rented out for a meal. But I had planned to wash his feet that night. I was overwhelmed with love for him and fear for his life. I had this nagging need to show him, demonstrate to him that I would do anything for him. Before I could even begin, he knelt before me. He insisted on washing my feet. I was horrified. I thought maybe he was losing his mind. One more time, he reversed the way I thought things should go. He just kept doing that. He said to me, you can't be part of the family of God, the kingdom of God, Peter, if you don't let me do this. As if I couldn't see that he really meant what he said about serving our neighbors, our friends, and our enemies. He always kept me off balance. I thought I knew what he meant, and then it seemed like I just wasn't getting it. I had to surrender all my preconceived ideas about how relationships were, how they go, who we love. I had to surrender, and let his loving act of washing my feet heal my soul and heal every disappointing relationship I'd ever had. Jesus used water to model the kind of love we must have for one another, a love that serves the least of our brothers and sisters. Washing takes on new meaning for us this year. Indeed, it is a symbol of our commitment to love our neighbors when we stay in our homes and wash our hands. You are invited to wash your hands this evening as a sign of love. If you have a basin in front of you, if you have some soap, feel free to wash your hands as a sign of love. Oh, hand sanitizer. And we continue. And you're invited to... Oh, no, no, no. 
Jesus was troubled in, in spirit that night, and he said, I'm telling you, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked at each other, not sure who or what he was talking about. Peter leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Jesus turned to Judas and gave him his own piece of bread. Go quickly, Jesus said to him. Do what you are going to do. I was so angry with him. Why wouldn't he fight? We had so many followers by this time, and so many were in Jerusalem right now. Why did he insist on this blessed are the meek stuff? I think all along I had hoped that this was a revolution, that he would finally stand up to the Roman occupiers. And he had such power and charisma. Couldn't he have done anything, this son of God? I suppose my bitterness finally took over. I kept it all inside for some time, and it started to boil and rage until I just snapped. I couldn't get, if I couldn't get my revolution, I could get out. I was tired of holding the purse for this motley group of people who gave it away as soon as it came in. And then I discovered I could get out with some money from those dirty Romans. It all happened so fast. They approached me. They had seen me, watched me, perhaps read my indecision, my anger, my separation at times from the group, and it just happened. And then there I was at the table, his table, knowing what I had set into motion. All of a sudden, I was flooded with panic as we all sat there. The air felt heavy with fear and unknowing at the table again. It reminded me of all the meals in our years together, sometimes just us, this small band of disciples, but often with someone Jesus had invited to dinner, someone we couldn't believe, yet again, he was hanging out with. Sometimes it was hard to understand. People who took advantage of others, people who had no interest in supporting him, people who questioned him, people who were beneath him. Really, he invited anyone to the table, the bottom feeders. And then I realized, as he stretched out the cup of wine to me and dipped the bread in it, that he saw right through me, knew my thoughts. He was doing it once again, inviting a scoundrel to dinner. Only this time, it was me. He was offering to share the cup and break the bed, bread with me. He would never have hurt anyone. He loved us all, even the lowest of the low.
After dinner, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus prayed. And then the soldiers came, and they arrested Jesus. They took him to the council and to the governor's palace, where they tried to make it look like a trial, but it wasn't. And then finally, they led him away to the place where criminals were hung, always on crosses, so that they would die slowly, painfully. Jesus was hung between two other crosses, bandits on each side of him. And the sign over Jesus' cross said, this was the king of the Jews. The scene was horrifying. Not that I wasn't used to crucifixions. They were the favored way of putting prisoners to death by the Romans, and so I'd assisted many times. But I'd heard about this man, Jesus. We thought Barabbas was going to be on this cross. But the crowds had come, had become almost out of control, and I had heard that Pilate simply washed his hands of it, sent this one to die just to shut them up. Who knows what these crowds were really screaming about? There was so much confusion and rumor, no one will probably ever know the truth, is what I think. But when the reality hit his followers that Jesus was really going to die, and they saw him heading to Golgotha with the cross, the horror really began. Even the heavens seemed to be wailing as storms began to appear. It gave me a chill, I'm going to tell you. These are not things I want to tell you. I am a soldier, but it is always easier protecting others than protecting yourself. From the mothers who beg for mercy for their sons, from those who insist on waiting the hours and even days it takes to die this agonizing death. Being a soldier can't always protect you from what you witness firsthand. Like hearing Jesus talk to the prisoners on the other two crosses next to him, the promise that death is not the end for them. And then he looked at me, right at me, and spoke words that I'll hear, hear for the rest of my life, and the words that mean I can no longer do this job anymore. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Later, after he died, they pierced him in his side. I still don't understand why, but in that moment, I knew he was truly the Son of God. His blood poured out just like the love he poured out for his people. The blood flowed from his side. The blood flowed. The love flowed. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, 
trembled. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and some other women he had known well. When he saw his mother and the disciple John there in front of him, Jesus said, Take this son in my place. Take good care of my mother. My son, from the moment the angel said to me, You will bear a son, my life was no longer my own. And yet it was every bit mine, moments treasured, remembered in my heart alone, every moment he grew within me every day of his youth, every moment of his ministry from that day at Cana to this very minute. At times, the pain of watching him give his life away seemed harder to bear than the wonder of this unimaginable life God had given me. And especially now, in this moment, I am not just the mother of Jesus shedding tears for my son. I am the tears of any mother who has seen their child die before them. I am the tears of every mother who has lost children in war and injustice. I am the tears of all loved ones who cannot save their loved ones as they starve or are taken by illness or injury or are swept away in a tsunami or a flood. I know the tears of mothers whose children lose their lives to addiction or are consumed by depression or who are lost to violence. And I am the tears of all those who do not know the fate of the missing one. I am the tears. Mark's Gospel mentioned our last character at the scene of the cross. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. Salome later accom accompanies the women to the tomb. I was there at the cross just as I had been there for the last several months one of his many followers, but I was not just a follower. I was companion to Mary, friend of Jesus, and the other Mary, mother of Jesus. And at this moment, they truly needed a friend. So many of the followers had fled as soon as the guards had come to the garden that night, but I could not leave. I would stay with my sisters, my friends, at the cross and through the agonizing depth of Sabbath-keeping stillness until it was time to anoint and prepare his body for bur burial. I knew how to tend to the dead. Tending to his body would perhaps help me find comfort in the darkness, there in the tomb with the memory of him even in his lifeless body. I would let my movements carry me into a future I was afraid I could not face. And so I kept my lamp close so that I could light it and lead us to the tomb after the Sabbath had passed. But that is a story for another morning. For now, I carry the lamp to keep us company in this vigil. For I know deep down that nothing can snuff out the light, the hope that he gave to all of us. We carry it within. I invite you, if you have a candle at your table, to light it. Salome and the others will lead us to the cross, where we will light our candles, a symbol of our prayers for all those who suffer injustice in this world. May the spirit of the living God go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, go beneath you to uphold and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion and dwell within you 
to remind you that you are surely not alone and that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Our time together this night will end at the cross. You are invited to stay before the cross as long as you like, leave when you feel ready, and go into the night. <laughs>